And I sent it and I typed it for my address book or whatever, just in case. So he should have it. I don't think he wants. To, I think he's trying to get out of it. <laughs> he. He might. He sounded a little bit spooked when it when it came up as round table, like. Yeah. So I kind of sent him an email. I was like, you know, I don't don't intend this to be like a two on one attack or anything. Like, I some pe- some right. friends are going to mention that too. Yeah. That like, he might have. He might. All right, we are live. Um, can everybody see and hear? Do your senses work? Can you see and hear me? Am I invading your senses, attacking you and assaulting your precious senses? I hope so, because I'm here with Dr. Bo Branson, and we are waiting on Carlos. Our uh, discussion tonight is going to be on Unitarianism, the Trinity, and the Monarchy of the Father. And uh, we have sent Carlos the link about five times, so as soon as he hops in here, we'll be ready to go. Here he comes. Here we go. He's here. Uh, and then I'm going to let. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. How you doing? Nice to hey. see you, Carlos. All right. It's working. Glad we finally got it, got it figured out. Thank you. Now I'm going to just be hosting and, and kind of letting y'all dialogue. Uh, I'm not going to be running the show here. So, um, and what I usually do, everything here is pretty laid back. I'll just let you guys kind of introduce yourselves and we'll go back and forth and you tell us who you are and I'll add all the pertinent links that are missing later. We, we, we've got Streamlabs, which is the replacement for Super Chat. So if anybody wants to ask questions, we've already got a couple of Streamlabs here. Uh, we'll save those for later, but uh, shout out to Gregory. He donated 10 bucks, much appreciated. Um, and then... Uh, couple other people have sense of super chats so we'll co- we'll get to those later but tonight we have carlos and we have dr bo branson so let's start with dr bo uh if you want to tell us who you are what your sure. focus is uh i've got your link below and uh yeah. and then we'll get to carlos and we'll start the discussion oh carlos uh, has a question sorry oh, yeah. jay can i can i record can you give access to record can you record oh, yeah uh zoom you just have to give me access to record uh on Zoom. Where do I do that? Uh, I should be down there in your options somewhere. Uh, if you go to participants, you know the little participants box and yeah, then go okay. to more? Okay. Okay. I thought you guys had used this before. <laughs> yeah, I've used it quite a bit, but I've never had anybody okay. ask me to record. So, oh, it's, um, it's no big deal if you want to. Uh... I mean, you want me to just send you the file afterwards? I'll send. Oh, you the yep, file. it's fine. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, doctor. You'll have it recorded. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, Doctor Branson, uh, uh, tell us about yourself and. Uh, sure. Okay. And then we'll let. Um, well, just uh, I'm a professor of philosophy here, um, and uh, basically, I so I specialized in philosophy of religion at Notre Dame, um, that and, and kind of metaphysics, and I. Um, my focus is really kind of the philosophy of the church fathers. I like to kind of delve into their, mostly their metaphysics and that sort of thing. So I did my dissertation on the doctrine of the Trinity, um, kind of some big philosophical, you know, challenges to it. Does it count as tritheism and this sort of question? Uh, Mostly that focused on uh, Gregory of Nyssa and the Cappadocians and their, their theology and kind of trying to get clear on some of their metaphysics and some of their answers to these questions. So that's kind of what I do. And in doing that, I guess I'll just say I I am uh, Dale Tuggy, of course, is another analytic philosopher who does philosophy of religion and has written a lot about the Trinity, who he's a biblical Unitarian. And so then I got kind of got me familiar with his work. And then uh, that's how I know about sort of uh, biblical Unitarians. Then Carlos just got a hold of me. I'm not I don't even know where you heard about me, but anyway, he got a hold of me and wanted to have a chat, and so uh, I suggested to to uh, have Jay host it and everything. So here we are. Hopefully, I'll learn even more about Unitarianism today. Thank you, uh, Carlos. Tell us about yourself and uh, where everybody can find you and what you're all about. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we actually uh, belong to the same Facebook group, Trinities. 
Uh -huh. So yeah. you you fall. And then I heard a lot of your dialogue with Dr. Tuggy yourself. So let's see. I'm just a guy born from Nicaragua in Central America. I bounced around in my youth. So I really did not have any formative religion. My where I come from, it's Catholic lands, you know, Hispanic territory, Spaniards back in the day, good old days. Not so good for us. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I grew up basically I, I describe myself as an agnostic. So, you know, you know, there's something there, but you don't quite know what it is. I am 45 years old now, but in my early 30s, when I was around 32, I had a that proverbial fork in the road moment, you know, and I started reading the Bible for the first time. Part of my family was very religious. They came from a sort of assemblies of God. If you're familiar with the Protestant denominations, uh, assemblies of God and Pentecostalism, things like that. So very into the spirit filled stuff, Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and all that jazz. And I sort of started reading the Bible with them. And I, I'm sort of a natural, I guess, non-Trinitarian. I sort of came to the view that, well, first of all, I, I have to explain to the audience that as an agnostic, the first hurdle is accepting that there is a personal God so that an actual entity, individual, whatever you want to call it, created the trees, the sky, and myself. So that's the first hurdle. After that comes the stuff, I guess, you read in the Bible about Jesus being the Son of God. So early on, I was uh, confronted with the Trinity and not knowing any better. I don't have any co uh, university degrees or anything. I just have a high school education. But I did have a, a love of ancient history. So I did a lot of courses at, at university at the time. And uh, so I studied the Trinity. I really did. I mean, I didn't dismiss it because, again, I did not know any better. But very quickly, I found that it was, you know, the books, dictionaries, encyclopedias kept saying that it was a post-biblical doctrine. And to me, that made sense. It, and then I got introduced to the councils, you know, Nicaea, Chalcedon, etc., and pretty much confirmed a lot of my suspicions that what I was reading in the scriptures was not lining up to the uh, what you might call Catholic Protestant tradition. So I started looking online for people, like-minded people, non-Trinitarians, and I found uh, Sir Anthony Buzzard and his ministry, which now I'm a part of, as you can see, Restoration Fellowship. And I've been working uh, with Sir Anthony and the ministry for the last... 10 years and full time for the last, uh, what is it, a year, year and a half or something. So that's where I'm at. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you for those introductions. And let's get to some of the uh, meat of the, of the issue. Why don't we, uh, Dr. Bo, do you want to start by kind of maybe give us the, the argument for why you think the Bible does teach the Trinity? And then we'll let, uh, we'll let Carlos respond to that. Sure. Um, I sent this to Carlos. I typed up a bunch of notes, but they they became like a like a short paper. So I'll just try to kind of um, maybe I'll just kind of give a, a brief outline of my thinking on it, and then whatever um, seems more interesting or controversial or whatever, we can kind of dig deeper in. But my um, my basic argument is I think that it. Uh, so I'll just, I'll say that I don't talk about this a lot, but I'll I'll just mention this that um, I had a period where I really wasn't. Um, it was after I had converted to orthodoxy, but I kind of just just was gone from the church for a number of years because um, of just some personal stuff that was going on. Um, <clears throat> never even during that period did I think. Um, that like, oh, I can finally just admit that the Trinity is a bunch of hooey now. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, I just think even from a historical point of view, just a purely secular point of view, 
Uh, I think it becomes really clear if you know much about late Second Temple Judaism and apocalyptic literature and so forth that, uh, and specifically what they people have termed the two powers in heaven heresy. Um, I think that it becomes very clear that the New Testament authors um, were apparently it would seem all uh, had a two powers theology, I would argue. So I, I think in particular, what I, I think that gets us to is that I think that they do not see any of the Old Testament theophanies as being God the Father. Um, I think they, they think those are all some other figure. Um, given that, then you have to go back to the Old Testament and read like all of the places where it says, you know, someone saw God or Yahweh appeared to so-and-so, uh, Yahweh is speaking to Moses and, you know, standing in the doorway of the tent and all this sort of thing. Uh, and you have to see like, well, can I read that in a, in a way such that that's not God the Father? And if it's, if it's not, if it's some second figure, what does that second person have to be like? Um, and I think that what best explains, so there's a lot of things that, that are weird about that. It, it seems like a weird view to us because we're not familiar with late Second Temple Judaism. And if you start reading apocalyptic literature from that period, it, it does seem kind of foreign. But once you kind of get, get your mind wrapped around it, it, it makes some sense. But people treat that figure as though it's Yahweh, and they think that they're going to die when they see him and they worship him and all this kind of thing. And so you have to ask what explains that. And so there's, you know, different different theories like Arianism uh, that the ancient Arians would say, well, that was, uh, you know, they would say that Jesus was the angel of the Lord or whatever, but they would say he's still a creature. Um, you know, you might say it's just a created angel or whatever, but uh, it doesn't make too much sense if it's, uh, let me put it this way, the, the sort of lower down on the totem pole you go with that figure, the less it makes sense that people treat him as though he's God and they think that they've seen God when they see him and so forth. And the more similar you think that being is to God the Father, the more it makes sense that people would you know, he would make the ground holy around him uh, and people would worship him and people would say, I've seen God and, and so forth. So my kind of, uh, I, I just kind of have an inference to the best explanation argument, the, the best way to make sense out of what I think New Testament theology amounts to is something like the doctrine of the Trinity, where you have uh, God the Father and then he has a son who is exactly like him in every way that's possible, right? So everything except just being the father. So that's kind of the, the basics of my argument. We can, we can delve into the details of, of whichever bit of that you agree with or don't agree with or, or whatever. Carlos, what's your thought? Well, I'd like to just state my position, if, if that's okay. Yeah, so sure. ba basically I come at it, uh, Dr. Branson from a, uh, I guess, purely sola scriptura, uh, scriptures alone position. So we go to the first and most important of all the commandments. So that's Deuteronomy 6. Uh, it's called the Shema, which Hebrew means obey, listen. Mm -hmm. And that was a commandment by God uh, about uh, himself. Uh, so here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, as you know, in Mark 12, when Jesus meets a fellow teacher or rabbi, you know, they're trying to test Jesus all the time in the Gospels. And they say, hey, Jesus, you know, let's see if you're a, a legitimate, you know, Jew. <laughs> and they, and uh, so he gives them the Shema and, and the rabbi goes on to say, uh, agreed, you know, amen. Uh, and, and he's one. Actually, the, the text says, uh, if you have the Bible in front, uh, Mark 12, 32, the scribe says to Jesus, you are right, teacher. You have correctly, correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him and to love him with all your heart and so on. So right there, now uh, we have one 
person in my mind, in anyone's mind, right? So the rabbi with Jesus, they agreed that God is a he, a him, mm -hmm. one singular person, or obviously, by the way, when I say God is a person, I mean, obviously, a non-human person, uh, the <laughs> deed. Yeah. I have to say that, Dr. Branson, some people go, oh, my people don't goodness, <laughs> blasphemy. What yeah. do you say? Um, so, and this figure in, in the Hebrew, the, the divine, the so-called tetragrammaton, the divine name, the four Hebrew letters, right? Yahweh, Jehovah, however you want to mm -hmm. uh, say it, pronounce it, uh, is there in the Shema, in the word Lord, translated Lord, as you know. <clears throat> and it's translated in the Greek as Kyrios, but it's definitely a personal name in the Hebrew. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we have the verification from the Old Testament scriptures that that Yahweh, that one individual, is the father. So you have texts like uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, uh, where Yahweh is identified as the father. And Isaiah 64, verse 8, but now Yahweh, you are our father. And then one that we really uh, like, <laughs> it's Malachi 2.10. Do we all, don't we all have one God? Do not, no. Don't we all have one father? So Yahweh, that Lord of the Shema, is always identified as the father in the Hebrew scriptures. It's verified that it's the father by Jesus. As you know, uh, the favorite New Testament uh, name, let's call it, for the God of Israel is Father, which is technically a title, but it, it's it's almost a name in the it becomes a name in the New Testament. So then the question arises: So who is Jesus? What is his relationship to this uh, God the Father? And that's where we got two hundred plus councils <laughs> debating the relationship between well if G well jesus is obviously more than a man you know he did things and and now he's in heaven and he's got all this power and i agree um jesus is not just quote a mere man mm -hmm. you know we're, we're always attacked non-trinitarians for uh, minimizing uh, the son of god as if we're saying he was just uh, a mere man whatever that means by the way but he was uniquely procreated in the womb, according to the virgin birth account. So you go to Luke 1, verses 30 to 35, where the angel says to Mary, you will have a son, and he will be the son of the Most High, and he will sit on the throne of his father David. And Mary says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. I haven't known any man. In other words, I haven't had sex with any man. And the angel explains that it's the power of the Holy God's Holy Spirit that will come upon her or over her and and enact this uh, what we call biological miracle in her womb, and that's the reason for this reason, says Luke one thirty five. For this very reason, the child, the thing born in you, will be the son of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. So again, God cannot be born. God cannot die obviously uh and then the adult jesus shows all the usual uh let's say he shows that he's a human being right throughout his mm -hmm. adulthood uh, so he's all, always subordinate to this god the father um you know he says things like he doesn't know the day or the hour as you know mark 12 32 so he's he's not exactly all knowing he knows a lot but he's not exactly all knowing. For example, he doesn't know the name of the demon legion. And he says, who, who are you? He has the, the, the demon, his name. Um, he's ultimately not good, Jesus. Ultimately, he's not good. So, not good? He, right. So remember uh, one time he's asked, yeah, uh, a teacher, you know, uh, you're a good person. He says, oh, hold on. There's only one who is good. And that is God. So in the ultimate sense of the word, the only one who is good for Jesus is God the Father. Obviously, I'm not saying Jesus was not good, but obviously in the ultimate. It sounds like uh, you just said it. Was... <laughs> well, that, that was the question posed to him. Uh, I, I believe it's Luke. Uh, is it 18? Luke, let me just. No, I, know, I know the passage you're talking about. Um, but... 
Well, let me see if I'm. Oh, I'm here back. we go. Why do you call me? So a ruler asked Jesus, Luke 18, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he called him good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, God. Mm -hmm. So, so again, these are things that if Jesus was somehow also God in some in some way, it, it's it's weird for him to say. Obviously, he was tempted. He suffered. He died. Obviously, I said that uh, he grew in stature and wisdom. Uh, in 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 the in uh, uh, how's the text go? Yeah, um, in the presence of God and okay. All right. So all right. So uh, let me let me butt in here because we've had about equal time for for both sides here. Uh, before we go back to Dr. Branson, uh, I got. <laughs> You said 200 plus councils. Is that what you said? Yes, I believe there were about 200 plus. What kind of council? What are you talking about? Maybe not ecumenical councils. You're talking about local councils. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, not not. Um, yeah, there were only so-called ecumen ecumenical councils. The more than a certain figure of bishops present, maybe a hundred or two hundred. Okay. But um, as far as just local councils or or. Uh, Christians, yeah. early Christians debating matters regarding yeah. uh, Jesus and such. So, okay. yeah, maybe to clarify that, I mean, a lot, a lot of times local synods meet um, sometimes just every two years, just kind of for practical purposes or whatever. The ecumenical synods, there's seven at least that the Orthodox recognize. I don't know, Jay, you'd know how many the Catholics have, but I, I don't keep track of the Catholic ones. Well, uh, Vatican IV. <laughs> Part four was the worst. Vatican four. Yeah, that um, was about two times worse than Vatican two. Man, four. Go ahead. Um, and, uh... Well, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll maybe respond to a few few of those things. So I I think the biggest thing to to maybe talk about is um, you mentioned that Jesus is subordinate to the Father, and that one of the things that is is a little bit different. So I Jay and I are both Eastern Orthodox, and this is one of the things that's um, kind of different and, and kind of makes uh, makes Unitarianism interesting to me, or biblical Unitarians, because they make a lot about this, that, you know, there's one God and it's the Father in the New Testament. Um, and the thing is that it, it so a, a couple of arguments um, There's one God, and that's the Father, and the New Testament's pretty clear that God is the Father, um, and that the Trinity is not really mentioned in the Bible explicitly, right? Um, and one thing that people don't always notice is that in the Nicene Creed, also, it says we believe in one God, the Father. Uh, now, I just had an, an interview with a, a Baptist pastor who's a friend of mine that lives near me here, and uh, we talked about this, how there's a lot of more sort of Western Christians are kind of uncomfortable with saying the Nicene Creed because it starts out saying there's one God, the Father. And they really think that the one God is, you know, the one God of the Bible is the Trinity. And I, I would say there's not necessarily anything wrong with, with talking that way, but you have to acknowledge that it's, it's a non, it, it's not the scriptural way of, of putting things. And it's actually not the way that it's put in the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed also never mentions the Trinity explicitly. So there's no explicit mention of the Trinity in that. Um, and when you talk about uh, being subordinate, one thing that Western Christians a lot of times kind of criticize Orthodox for, for in their mind, it's it's a problem. Uh, they, they'll call us subordinationists because we believe that uh, God the Father is the one God, when the, when the Bible is talking about the one God, that's the father. Um, and he alone is self-existent. So what, what we would say is that the father uh, is, is absolutely self-existent. Uh, and he caused, he, we believe that he timelessly and eternally causes uh, the son and the spirit. So they are, are dependent on the father in a, in a way that the father is not dependent on them. But we do say that they have the same nature as the Father. So the, what's the big issue in the Nicene Creed was that word homoousius, meaning of the same nature. Um, uh, Gregory of Nyssa glosses this as the same species in some of his works. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. 
but of course for us, it's not such a big, um, uh, it's maybe not as seemingly problematic because we, we would say, of course, that, um, uh, so, you know, there are other gods mentioned in the Bible. The sons of God are also called gods. Um, God stands in the congregation of gods and he judges gods and so forth. Um, and of course, John says that those who believe in Jesus, uh, to, to those who believe in him, he gave power to become sons of God. And so we, in the Orthodox Church, we talk about how we will become, quote unquote, gods by grace. Um, and in, in Daniel, for example, it says, you know, the wise will shine uh, like the firmament, like the stars of heaven, right? So uh, a way that I explain it to people sometimes is sort of if you, if, if you're familiar with the idea of the Shekinah, which a lot of people are, and maybe glory uh, in our language doesn't doesn't carry quite the same weight um, um, as as Shekinah does for people. But you might think about it this way: that that God the Father has the Shekinah glory just from Himself, but He grants the Son and the Spirit to be of the same nature and to have it by nature. Uh, we are not going to have it by nature. We're not going to have the divine nature. That's not in the cards for us, but we can take on to varying degrees uh, in the same way that Moses did when he went up to Mount Sinai. And when he would come down, his face would be shining with, with the glory of God, but then it would fade away. So one, the church fathers sometimes use this example. If you put a sword inside fire, uh, eventually you take the sword out and it also is giving off light and heat, right? So it takes on the energies of the fire, but it doesn't have those energies by nature. It's not in the nature of fire to, or it's not in the nature of a sword or metal to have that, but it can take it on. The idea is that we can, we can participate in that too. So for us, it's a little bit less, um, I mean, of course there, there's, there's a sense in which there's only one God, but there's a sense in which there, uh, there are many gods, just not gods by, nature or not sort of self-existently God. Um, and so uh, we, we do think, because we think that the Father is the only one who just is God of himself, um, there is a sense in which you can say we're subordinationists or whatever. Um, so in, in any case, I mean, for us, the, those sorts of, so we get, I guess maybe we're criticized from both ends, so that, you know, Catholics and Protestants would say, well, you're not quite egalitarian enough about your, your views of the Trinity. And um, in a lot of the church fathers and, and even today, um, you know, we will talk about the one God as being the father. And that's not something that, that sort of worries us. Um, they don't like that because it's kind of not egalitarian enough. But uh, on the other hand, the criticism that, well, the one God in the Bible is just the father, um, we don't really see any, any problem with that because that, I mean, that's kind of our view. Um, I don't know if I, if, if you want me to kind of address some of these others, if I've talked enough about that yeah. or you want to respond. Can I ask, can I ask so, a question? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So I do not interact with, uh, is it Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox? Same? Yeah. Eastern Orthodox. They're all kind of the same Eastern Orthodox. Okay. Uh, so I had a quick, and I had a question about your your view of the monarchy of the father. Yeah, yeah. So, as far as I understand, I I tried to listen to a lot of the tuggy exchanges. And oh yeah, yeah. Your, so your position is that the father alone is God, right? And and the son and the spirit are also God. Is that correct? So it, it depends on how you use this the word God, right? So what I would say is it's clear in the Bible, right, that there's, there's some sense in which there's one God, right? Um, but then there's some sense in which there are all these other gods, right? So God stands in the congregation of gods and judges the gods. Well, we, we've got to make sense of both, right? We, my view is we've got to try to hold on to both of those, right? We, we have to acknowledge that there's a sense in which the scriptures want to say there's one God. I mean, Paul even kind of summarizes that just saying, yeah, there be gods many and lords many, but for us, there's the one God, the Father and one Lord, Jesus Christ, right? Right. Uh, so, I'm talking, obviously, yeah. capital G, ultimate sense, God, mm -hmm. obviously. That's the Well, again, I mean, it kind of depends on what the capital G God 
means, right? Um, well, let me let me ask you this, Doctor. Yeah. God, God is how many persons exactly? Yeah. One. Who? who? The Father. Which, which person? Yeah. Okay, so so God is unipersonal, and He's the Father. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus is not God in that. He's not the Father. Ultimate... Yeah, no, he's he's not the Father. How? <laughs> See, now I'm confused because I thought that's what you had written and said. So how is that Trinitarianism? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, so, I mean, for us, the issue has never been to call it Trinitarianism, right? For the, the big issue for us that came up in, for our church that came up in the fourth century was, uh, you know, do the father and the son have the same usia, the same nature or essence. Um, and so we say yes to that. <laughs> uh, so think about it this way. Uh, if, um, you know, suppose there's a cow just floating in space and it's just uh it was never caused to come into existence. It's just this eternal cow, you know. Um, could it give birth to a cow? Well, sure. I mean, it's a it's a weird cow if it if it was never caused. To come to, but but right. So the whether you're caused or uncaused doesn't uh, doesn't make you a member of a different species, right? So we kind of have. Uh, so here, here's sort of how the hierarchy would work. You, you've got God the Father is just uncaused, right? He's a necessary being. He's always existed and so forth. Uh, the Son and the Spirit are caused but not created. So in other words, they, there's never been a time when they didn't exist. So just like, you know, you can't have fire without heat or without light, right? Um, as soon as you've got fire, you've got light and heat coming out of it. So we say that as soon as you have the father, you, you have the son and the spirit. Um, so they're not creatures because they were not brought into being out of non-being, right? Um, and they have the same nature as the father. They're, they're the same sort of beings as the father is. But the father just has his being of himself, um, whereas the son and spirit are dependent upon the father. They're his right. emanations yeah. or whatever you want to call it, not creation because they didn't come out of non-being. Right. So but then, of course, we come out of non-being, so into being. Right. So when we make these distinctions in the Godhead, we're making distinctions based on what we think is revelation. And we don't pick out like specific parts of revelation that we want to focus on. And we have to take the whole body of what's revealed. I mean, you mentioned scripture there's many places in scripture where there's a distinction uh, that's mentioned in God. I can give you a list of about 30 right off the top of my head. Um, so I'm not going to exclude all of those because I want to focus on this or that passage that admits the unity, right? I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. the, our view is that <clears throat> you've got both unity and distinction in God. And so which position can really make sense of these things in a coherent way? That's the approach that, that I think is the best way to look at this question. So when we talk about the person of the father, we think he's autotheos, right? He is not of anyone else. Uh, and he has that nature that, that he has. It's, he is the beginning point. He is the self-existent hypostasis. But the, the son and the spirit are different uh, and they come from him. But that doesn't mean that they're in a lesser ontological status. And the reason for that is because we don't import into our doctrine temporal or uh, creation-related categories in a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So this is what the Arians did when they debated this question. They would always say, well, if you call the Father the cause, he's got to be, in some metaphysical ontological sense, prior to, greater than, better than, higher than his... Uh, the, the, the persons that he produces, right? But the, uh, the fathers in our church were very clear to argue against that by saying, why, why? I mean, on what basis do we have to assume that created in temporal causation, right, has a one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of primacy or chronological, you know, uh, 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 placement in God? It's just an analogy, right, to say that the father is the, the cause of the son, 
is an yeah. analogy to created causation. It's not to say that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so therefore the father was temporally the cause before the son, you see. Yeah. It's just an analogy, right? So in the same way, when we say true God from true God, light from light, right? To make a distinction between things does not presuppose or necessitate that there has to be some gradation because you, you cited the Shema, for example, and that's true, there is one God, right? The Father is the beginning of the Godhead. He is the source, he is the fount, he is the cause, the arche, etc. But there's all of these passages, and again, if you want me to, I'll list them, but dozens that mention in the Old Testament a real distinction between the angel of the Lord who's worshipped and the Father who sends that angel or the father who puts his name into that angel, or the father who redeems his people through that angel. And angel just means messenger. It's just a generic term. Just like Bo's using the term God in two different senses, one, one in a generic sense of deity or deities. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, angel can be a messenger, human, created angel, or divine. The messenger of the covenant, the logos himself. So that's what we're trying to get at here is that you got to take into account the whole package of Revelation and because any group that picks out this or that text will fall into some weird heresy because they're focusing on one aspect of Revelation without balancing out the whole. And hmm. Carlos should have a turn to talk. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, it's a lot. There's a lot there. Well, first I would ask, well, first I would say that the position I represent um, holds to the language regarding the son's creation. So we have the virgin birth. So in the virgin birth, Matthew talks about the origin of, of the Messiah, Jesus. So that's Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and Matthew 1.18. The origin of the Messiah, Jesus, happened this way. So that's a, the origin. Now, if you want to say, I believe one of the Irenaeus maybe talked about a double origin. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys hold to that. Well, that's that's fine. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, we describe it like this. If you start your car, your car is running. Right. But then you you want to start it again. But it, the the running has already <laughs> happened. And then you're you're wanting. So that's one of the problems with a double origin, apart from just the, it's, it's, it sounds to me anyway, nonsensical. And the other word, as you gentlemen know, is the word translated begotten. Mm -hmm. So begotten is, is, is an old antiquated word that comes from the King James. And, and we tell people that's why you should try and use uh, newer versions, newer translations, you know, the new American standard Bible and things like that. Um, I believe, so, so we have that word begotten. So we have it in, again, in Matthew 1, 20, uh, the angel says to Joseph, I believe in a dream, that the one begotten in Mary, right, is of the Holy Spirit. And then we have a form of the word beget, begotten or beget, yenao, in Luke uh, 1, 35, that, that the son is is procreated. So that that language, and then you have the famous Psalm 2-7, uh, which says uh, it, it's a prophecy, right? And and it talks about a day, a specific day, when the son will be begotten. Today I have begotten you, I have become your father. Now, again, if you want to hold to the church fathers, I believe it was a Origen who said, well, the day there is an eternal day, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's, again, that, that's something I, I have issues with or, or our position has issues with. But let me ask you, gentlemen, a question about the messenger. So the Hebrew is malak and the Greek is angelos. I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation, by the way, anyone out there. Yeah. Um, now that it's translated uh, usually as angel. Now, do you gentlemen have any problem with that translation? Because the word angel, obviously, uh, by definition, means a creature. 
do, do you guys or do you use I, another I word how, there or yeah, what other word should we use? It, it doesn't so it yeah doesn't? I, I wouldn't uh i wouldn't say it the the word angel by definition means a creature well does angel um, mean god if, the god the if, ultimate i mean if in english if someone thinks like the word angel just has to mean a creature then uh, I'd say then it's just better to translate it literally as a messenger. Well, how about the word messenger? Does messenger connote a creature? And it's just someone who delivers a message. Right. In the Bible, a messenger or a, an angel is usually understood as a creature. I mean, I'm trying to... No, but it's not. See... That's the point is that, I mean, there's multiple places where the angel of the Lord, the messenger is referred to. Uh, as a representative yeah. separate from the person of Yahweh who is given divine reverence and worship. Mm -hmm. He's spoken of as a savior, as a redeemer, uh, as having the name of God himself. Right. So, okay. That, I this is I some... say this. I mean, it, suppose that there were two or three divine persons, right? Um, I don't see why one wouldn't be able to carry a message or deliver a message on behalf of another. Right. The, the, the point I'm trying to get at is that as far as I know, I don't have the lexicons in front of me, but I, I believe there is no lexicon. Maybe one of our viewers can show me where Malak or Angelos does not mean a creature. Uh, well, I maybe, mean, maybe there is only know. if you may have a sort of circular argument, right? I mean, so if, if we're if we're using the word Malak or Angelos to to refer to Jesus or to refer to the angel of the Lord, I mean, on the assumption that I mean, I know you reject all that, so I, I'm, I'm aware, but but I mean, uh, on the assumption that that it's uh, referring in some let's let's just say the angel of the Lord because it's uncontroversial. He's referred to as an angel um so it you know it would be the, the only way to make the case that angel always refers to a creature would be to make a circular argument and just assume that the angel of the lord's a creature right? yeah, i mean do you want me to give you the passages where you can see that the angel of the lord is actually uh, referred to as uh, divine i mean I'm oh, sure. I, I, you're probably well aware of these, right? Yes, I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't have issues with um, people identifying the messenger as Jehovah Yahweh himself. Yeah, but it's distinct from Yahweh. That's the point. He sent the angel is sent by Yahweh, and he's worshipped. Right. The way we understand that is that, for example, the passage I believe it's Exodus 23, when he sends his messenger. Uh, to help the Israelites in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And he says, I will put my name in him. And as you know, name in, mm -hmm. in the Bible, it's a Hebrew idiom, meaning he will have that. Yes, I agree, uh, Jay. It's a separate. I'm not saying there's no distinction. I'm saying. Well, doesn't God say I give my name to no one else? Well, he gives names to us. And we actually have new names in the book of Revelation. And Jesus actually says in John 17, yeah, I have an, given Can an them... angel redeem somebody, though? Well, let, let me ask you about the name, Jay. In John 17, Jesus says, I have revealed to them your name. Mm -hmm. I have given them your name. So... Yeah, it... that's what we okay. believe in theosis. We participate in, in uncreated grace. But you just said he gives his name to no one? Well, we become sons of God by grace, but he does by nature um, can, can uh, convey the divine nature to the son and to the spirit so we agree that god confers not just name but glory power to people he chooses yeah but your right? reading of the shema says he does not convey his name to anyone else go ahead doctor you have um, your... <laughs> I, yeah this is something that comes up, I think, a lot in these discussions about the, the I, I'm not I'm not as familiar with the name, but the, the glory. Um, so there's the passage in Isaiah where he says, I will not give my glory to another. If you read the Targum on Isaiah, um, which is the, for people who don't know, the old the ancient Aramaic translation from Hebrew to Aramaic that was kind of done for um, popular reading for people at the time of Christ and a little bit after 
Um, there, it, so they translate to Aramaic, but they also a lot of times gloss things so people can understand that there it's clear that the interpretation they gave to that was, this is God saying, um, they interpreted it to be like to Israel, but, um, but any, or anyway, the, the passage looks like it's really to the Messiah, but it looks like it's God speaking to the Messiah and saying, I will not share my glory with anyone else other than you, the Messiah that I'm speaking to, right? And we see in the New Testament, Jesus says he will return in the glory of his father, right? So we have to think that God the Father is sharing his glory with the Messiah, but then Christ can share that glory with us. So it looks like God is sort of God the Father is saying he doesn't share his glory with anyone other than the Messiah. And then it's the Messiah's prerogative to share that glory with his disciples and his people or not, and, and so forth. Well, um, go ahead. I will, I would just quickly, I would say about that, uh, doctor, that the so-called uh, suffering servant cycle in Isaiah, right? So mm -hmm. Isaiah, is it 42 to 53 yeah. or so, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it has two meanings, right? There, there, there are things that are double prophecies. Mm -hmm. That's what most of us hold to, I believe. So there, the servant is Israel, the nation, right? Uh, it actually calls it uh, on Israel in, in Isaiah 42 yeah. or 43, I believe. And obviously, then that's apply the suffering servant image and description to Jesus, the Messiah, right? So... And it has a lot of glory going on. So I have just a quick verse here, Isaiah 49, 3. So God says, you are my servant, Israel. You will bring me glory. And then he talks about the glory that God gives to his people, Israel, in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And yes, obviously, we, I think we agree here, uh, by the way, that okay. it's definitely yeah. a delegated glory. Mm -hmm. Right. So he do God does give his glory to whom he wants to. He gives it obviously to his son. And in turn, now in the Christian era, he'll yeah. give it to members of the body of Christ, yeah. us, the saints. Maybe I, think maybe, I, maybe I went off on a, on a tangent there. Maybe that wasn't what we were disagreeing <laughs> with. But anyway, it's good to see we, we agree about something. That's good. Can, can I ask you, Dr. Um, about the singular personal pronouns. So uh -huh. I believe in the conversations you've had with Dr. Tuggy, mm -hmm. um, one of your go-tos is the Cappadocian Fathers, specifically yeah. Ger Gregory of Nazianzus or Nisa. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Now, there's a quote that Dr. Tuggy had. Um, he's uh, from Gregory. Mm -hmm. This is from his oration number 31, if anyone's... He says, I will persuade all men to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the single Godhead and power. Mm -hmm. And they says, because to him belong all glory, honor, might forever and ever. Amen. My question is, who is him in that equation? Hold on one second. And um because I'm pretty sure this is one of these things where it, uh, he, so Dale mentioned a couple of things where it's not actually there in the Greek. And I think this may be one of them. Do you know which section in oration 31 that is? I just have oration 31 page 143. But my question has to do with the fact that oftentimes, and it doesn't have to be this specific one, but I believe uh, it was his, um, custom to call the trinity to call the the godhead father son holy spirit as a he or him yeah uh, I, don't, so to, I don't think there's a single case where he ever does that um dale believes okay. that he he does but dale doesn't really read greek <laughs> or if he can he chooses not to so i there i i don't think that i've ever seen a case where where gregory nazians and um uh, well, f first of all, did you say that he refers to the Trinity as him or he? Yes, he says I okay, will. So that is that is not even 
possible, right? So in Greek, Trinity is a she. Um, and so he would have to refer Trinitas. To, yeah, Trinitas. Right. Tri trias. Uh, trias. Is, yep. is a um, feminine. So if he's referring to the Trinity, he has to use a, a feminine pronoun. Now, the, the problem is that in English translations, two things happen. One is that there's a lot of Greek constructions where there is no pronoun, but it sounds weird in English. And so translators will supply a pronoun that's just not there in Greek. Uh, the other issue is that sometimes, um, uh, frankly, I mean, translators are just kind of uncomfortable with the way that Gregory actually words things. And so they just change it because they believe that they're preserving the meaning or whatever, but it's not really word for word what, what he says. Um, I, so Dale recently published a paper that I actually invited him to publish in a, in a journal that I'm editing. And so I edited the paper and uh, I'll just say that none, I don't think any of the stuff that he cites is, is actually legitimate. Um, and there's a response paper coming out to him that, that mentions some of these things that in some of the cases, there's no pronoun really there in the Greek. And in some cases, the pronoun grammatically has to refer to the father and not to the Trinity and, and so forth. But I don't know of a single case where Gregory clearly uh, refers to the Trinity as a he or a him, but he can, I mean, he can refer to it as she or it or whatever. I mean, it's, uh, he, he may, um, for all I know, he, he may have believed that there's some entity called the Trinity um, but he doesn't apply the word God with a definite article to that being. And he's also extremely clear that only the father is unoriginate. Um, and he, he's very clear that um, the son and the spirit are caused to exist by, by the father. In fact, um, I just got to think of... Uh, poems of Gregory uh, Nazianzus where he, you know, he says there's one God, the, the great and mighty father of a great uh, only begotten and faithful son. Um, he says the, the logos of God is other than the one God and so forth. So um, he's, uh, he also at one point in one of his homilies or yeah, it was one, one of his homilies, he, he says this, he says, after he gets done talking about the father, he says, you know, we have one God, the father. And then he says, uh, and there's Jesus Christ, he says, is referred to or addressed as God when mentioned separately, uh, but referred to as Lord when mentioned together with the father. And then he says, the first is on account of the shared nature and the second is on account of the monarchy. So in other words, what he says is, if we're talking about Jesus just in himself and we're not talking about God the Father, then we can refer to him as God uh, because he has the same nature. So think, I mean, an analogy I give people is this, like if I show you a picture of my wife, right, I can say, this is my wife, right? I can, and I'll refer to that as my wife as long as she's not in the room. But if she walked in the room, it would be weird to keep pointing to the photograph and saying, this is my wife. I, once she's in the room, I should say, oh, okay, here's my wife, right? Um, so I can do that because the picture looks like my wife, right? It's a representation of my wife. Um, but he says, when we're mentioning Christ together with the Father, we no longer refer to him as God. And that's, that's pretty hard to reconcile with a, a view where the one God is kind of all three persons equally together. Um, I think it looks like he does really think that the one God, strictly speaking, is the Father, but we can we can refer to the Son and the Spirit as God because they share the same nature and they are images of of the Father. So, what do you make, Doctor? Just your opinion about I've debated a lot of Trinitarians mm -hmm. in the last year or so. I think I about yeah. six debates. <laughs> and, and invariably, I've noticed something interesting that they use singular personal pronouns for the Trinity, for the Trinity, for, yeah. for all three at the same time. So, for example, I ask them questions about in the Old Testament when when Yahweh God says uh, Isaiah forty four twenty four, mm -hmm. one of our favorites. He says, 
I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who mm -hmm. spread out the earth by myself, who was with me. Isaiah 44, 24. Mm -hmm. And to my astonishment, and perhaps yours, that's why I wanted to get your mm -hmm. opinion. What do you make of the response that has been, oh, that can be all three persons speaking as, as a that that I can or can't be. Yeah. Well, I didn't hear what you said. Can't that that can or can't be. That they say it can be all three persons speaking. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you make of that as a as a philosopher? Well, I th I think there's more to the pronoun issue. Um, so. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, but there are cases where singular pronouns can refer to multiple persons at the same time. Um, I don't know that this, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if this is one of them. I'd have to kind of look and see what I think my, my interpretation of that is. But I do know that, that biblical Unitarians kind of put a lot of stock in these arguments about pronouns. And um, so there's an, an, a dissertation in linguistics that, I, that, that ties into this, and it's called... Um, something like I rolled a one, now I'm dead. And it's uh, um, uh, a linguist who she kind of puts together a lot of uh, transcripts of people actually playing Dungeons and Dragons and how they talk. So linguists want to be empirical, you know, about things. So they put together transcripts of things people actually say, and then they kind of analyze it. Then one of the things that this woman points out is... Um, how seamlessly people, when they're playing like role-playing games, how seamlessly they transition back and forth between referring to themselves and referring to the fictional characters that they're playing in the game. So that's what that sentence is about. I roll the one, their I refers to the human player, right? And then I died, their I refers to the fictional character. But you can even, and you might think, well, there's like an equivocation or something, but you can even have sentences where there's only one instance of the pronoun even. So you might say, uh, I rolled a one and died, um, you know, or he rolled a one and is therefore dead, something like that. So there, the one pronoun is actually sort of picking up references to multiple figures. Um, so you can have kind of weird cases like that. And I guess I'm not sure why a priori I would think that that wouldn't happen with something like the Trinity. So especially in, in our way of thinking about it, where Christ, we say, you know, Christ is the icon of the invisible God. So we, we kind of take, um, we take that pretty seriously. So, you know, God, the father, uh, no one has ever seen God, right? So the New Testament authors are very clear that no one has ever seen God. He dwells in unapproachable light. Uh, no man could possibly see God. But yet here's God in the Old Testament appearing to people all over the place. So uh, Christ as the icon of the invisible God, meaning the, the visible image, right? So, um, when you have that sort of relationship, a, a one thing represents another, we frequently do kind of uh, go back and forth with between different names. So she notes this in the dissertation too, like people will say, um, they'll switch the names of the, the human player and the character back and forth. Um, they'll use pronouns that go kind of switch back and forth. So they'll, they'll sort of seamlessly transition back and forth. And it seems like you see that kind of thing in the Old Testament with the angel of the Lord. And then you see, you know, uh, people talking in the New Testament about Christ being the exact image and the icon and so forth. So I guess I wouldn't be, uh, I'd, I'd have to look at that particular passage and think about, you know, what I think it's saying. Um, but I wouldn't, I guess, be a priori opposed to the idea that that um, not not I, so I wouldn't uh, I, I guess I, I'm not a huge fan personally of saying that when God is talking or referring himself it's the this entity called the Trinity um, but I uh, I'd be open to the idea that sometimes a pronoun might kind of refer to different figures at the same time or something like that so you so but, you call 
Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So you called the, the Trinity an entity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that's how people think of it. I don't really think of it that way. I just think of the, the Trinity just means the three, but... The three um, persons. But some people, I guess, think of it as, as like a kind of quasi-individual or something. Um, right. Yeah, that, that was my question. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the reason we put... You say we put so much stock on singular person. Well, it's simply because the Bible, you know... Yeah tens of thousands of times or whatever, thousands of times, the, the God, the God, the one God of Israel to yeah. them, to the Jews. So were, so were the Jews um, um, aware of this understanding of, of, of God or were they purely at one stage like me uh, thinking that <laughs> only, only the father was, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard to know what the average Joe thought, but I mean, I, I guess I would say I, I, I suppose that the prophets were aware of, of this. Um, they, they were aware that there were three persons. Uh, I, I as, think it as seems God like, or um, I mean, I, I guess the role of the Holy Spirit is not always super clear in the Old Testament, but it's also not super clear in the New Testament, I guess. Or, um, but uh, I, I certainly think that um, uh, there, there's an awareness that there were, there were two figures. There was a, an in, sort of a God that remains hidden and unrevealed and unseen and uh, some being who appears and reveals that figure so that that God is revealed through um, so, so my, I mean, I know you don't, you don't agree with this, but, but my view would just be that God revealed himself through this being who's sometimes called the angel of the Lord, sometimes called the word of the Lord. Um, uh, so I think Samuel says, you know, Yahweh revealed himself through the word of the Lord. Um, and so I think that, yeah, that was going on in the Old Testament. I know a lot of Trinitarians sort of have this view that it wasn't that wasn't revealed until the new Testament or something like that. Um, that's, that's not really my view. I mean, so, I, you know, if, you, if someone wants to say something like it wasn't very clear in the old Testament, I mean, sure. Right. But, uh, but I think that it was, was known. I think the the prophets kind of understood. that. Was so, so some scholars, Dr. Uh, evangelical scholar or pro, from the Protestant tradition, uh, there's a book called uh, from Jewish prophet to Gentile God. And it sort of, there's a quote that that I've read over the years that sort of reflects this, what, what I think is mainstream. Uh, so I'll get your opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's basically that the idea that the that the Messiah or Jesus in this case was deity, you know, in the way that you're understanding deity was, uh, I think, Dr. Casey called it inherently un-Jewish. Mm -hmm. Because the witness of Jewish texts is unvarying regarding uh, the the deity being just the Father Yahweh, the, mm -hmm. and so a belief that a second being is God involves a departure from yeah, the I mean, Jewish community. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that there's a uh, you know, a second God. I mean, there, I'd, I'd say, there's... well, when you, you talk about the two powers and I agree, actually, yeah. I agree with you when mm -hmm. you add that it was a heresy. Because <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's according known... to Jews, it's a heresy. I don't, I don't think it's, well, heresy, but it's I mean... known as the two powers heresy yeah. for yeah. a reason. Uh, yeah. You know, I always well, say yeah, doctor, because because Jews think it's a heresy. Right. I always say, doctor, that the chosen people of God we're not exempt from idolatry, right? So they were not exempt from being wrong uh, regarding their worship of sure. God. Yeah, but I just I do think that it's it's pretty clear that the the New Testament authors held to that sort of theology. Um, so the one one issue, I guess I should say this too. So a kind of methodological issue is I see a lot of times. Like I notice you going back to Old Testament. Um, I mean, you mentioned the Shema and the in mark and that sort of thing but um the kind of old testament exegesis and i guess my feeling is if i 
uh, if I was really convinced that the Old Testament could not possibly be read in any other way than, than having a, a one power theology, right? Um, then I just would become Jewish because I would, I would think that the, the New Testament authors must have misunderstood it because they just, they seem like they were one of these uh, late second temple two powers theology kind of people. And it's very clear because the central issue in that debate, or at least one of the central, one of the biggest issues was whether God can be seen or not. And why, you know, there's this kind of tension in the Old Testament between no one can see me and live, but then everybody and their mother ends up seeing God, you know, and then saying, ah, I can't believe I, we saw God and lived. And, and that came to be a, a point of contention, you know, how do we, how do we make sense out of that. And I, uh, in that little document that I put together, um, I guess maybe I'll put a, I'll pop a link in the, in, in there somewhere if you want to read about it, but the, um, the, the, there, there's kind of two ways to, to reconcile that tension, right? Um, if you say no one can see God, there's the quantifier, no one, and then there's seeing, right? And then there's God. And so one way to, to resolve that tension is to restrict the quantifier and say, well, it doesn't mean no one, it means no sinful person or no one who, you know, doesn't have a certain priesthood or this or that, whatever it might be. So you restrict the quantifier. Another way is adverbially to modify the seeing, right? So it's no one can, you can't see God at this time, but you can see God this other time. You can't see God physically, but you can see him spiritually, or, you know, there's a way that you can and the way that you can't. Uh, and if, if you look in the Book of Mormon, the, the Mormons believe that people have seen the Father, and you can see in the Book of Mormon what they've, they've done is exactly those things. So there's numerous places in the Book of Mormon where it says no sinful person can see God, or no one can see God with their physical eyes, but you can with your spiritual eyes. So they they always trade on either the quantifier or the, the verb. Um, the, and that's what you have to do if you've got a one power theology, because you don't want more than one person being referred to as God. But the New Testament authors never do that. And, and the only other way to, to resolve the contradiction is to say there's two different figures that in the Old Testament that sometimes get referred to as God. And well, I, the New Testament authors always, when they talk about this, they never modify the quantifier. They never modify seeing they, and they sometimes mention a second person, which is Jesus. Right. Well, I, I certainly agree, doctor, that I, one of the things that probably uh, I'm theorizing here, mm -hmm. along with some scholars, one of the things that probably led to this so-called two powers heresy mm -hmm. were texts like Psalm 110 verse one. Which yeah, is one so. of the one of the most used verses by the New Testament authors. It's the most quoted. You know, uh, it's not the most quoted. That's actually uh -huh. Daniel seven thirteen. By the way, it's uh, alluded oh. to or quoted over oh, forty alluded. times. Well, okay. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. Uh, so, but you're right. It's uh, quoted. Uh, I don't know twenty times. Psalm one hundred ten one. Now, it does. Uh, to us anyway, the language of that verse, which is very important. So it's a prophecy of David, right? A Psalm of David. Uh, it's um, alluded to by, uh, is it Peter at the day of Pentecost in Acts 2? Mm -hmm. He says that our King David in a vision, right? And it says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make um, your enemies your footstool. So one of the things that especially Sir Anthony Buzzard uh, mm -hmm. has been harping on for decades now is mm -hmm. the fact that the language there clearly distinguishes between deity, yeah. the supreme deity, Yahweh. So in mm -hmm. the Hebrew, it's, it appears as Yahweh says to Ladoni. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you're probably familiar with, with the argument from the language. This is just a people can check this out, and I hope you do. And that's translated in the Greek as tokiriomu, a phrase that is never used for deity, for God. Mm -hmm. Tokiriomu, which means to right. my Lord, right? So those are the kinds of things that I believe give clear evidence to the 
what we call unitary Jewish faith of not only the patriarchs, the prophets, the kings, but obviously Jesus, because, you know, he cites the Shema and, and he agrees with the Jew. I don't believe, by the way, that the Jew that Jesus agreed with in Mark 12 uh, was anything but a, a Jewish unitary monotheist. W sure. Wouldn't you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think the, I think the Jewish guy was, <laughs> was probably a Unitarian. Um, so which, I, which would I, make, um, doc, which would yeah, make yeah. Dr. Jesus, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> I think that Jesus was a, was a two powers heretic. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll say a little bit if you, uh, if you want about the, the Lord said to my Lord and all that, please, I, please do. It, it's, and actually, um, you might be happy to know. I, I, oh, I disagree with you. I disagree with everyone about this. So I, I'm a. Uh, You're a lone uh, wolf. Uh, yeah, I, I, I even think. Um, I, I think that the church fathers even have have this wrong too, because they use. I, I looked one time. Um, I spent a long time in the library looking at every commentary I could find on on uh, those verses and. Everybody uh, that I've found tries to sort of make it about two natures Christology, right? So it's this, he's the Lord in his divine nature. He's the son of David in his human nature. Um, and I don't think that that was the, the original in, intent. So I'll, I'll kind of give you my little pet theory uh, on, on that. Um, as you know, so, you know, in, in Hebrew, you only have consonants, right, um, in, in the text. So, so Adoni uh, would be my Lord and Adonai would be the Lord. And that, so Adonai is kind of, um, uh, that is usually reserved as kind of a polite way of saying Yahweh. And Adoni just means, you know, my Lord. It's just a respectful kind of title. So um, here's the here's what my problem is with with all the kind of commentators on this is that it it seems absolutely clear to me that when Jesus says um, uh, if if the Messiah is the son of David then how can David call him Lord that that's a rhetorical question and and all his commentaries start out by saying yeah it's a rhetorical question but then they treat it as though it's not a rhetorical question right so they treat it as though it's like jesus really needs to know you know how does, how does david say this? and the answer is two natures christology this is the solution right um but that's not how a rhetorical question works right if if you say how can p and q both be true what you really mean is they can't both be true, right? So like, if you say to me, like, you know, if you were saying to a Trinitarian, how can God be three in one? Like what you really mean is this doesn't make sense, right? It can't be both. So when G it, I read that just the way it, it looks as a rhetorical question and what he's saying is it can't be both. Um, it can't be that Jesus, that the Messiah is the son of David and also David calls him, Adoni, right? And, and of course, if, if you say in English or in Greek, and I think this is why the church fathers kind of go off on a wrong tangent with it. If you say in Greek or in English, like, how can he call him my Lord? And you say, well, so Jesus didn't think that he really called him my Lord. Um, well, that sounds like Jesus is denying that the scriptures are true. Um, and it does, it certainly doesn't do anything to prove his divinity, which is what uh, the church fathers think this is supposed to be doing. But if you look at it in the Hebrew, right, if he says, uh, how could David call him Adoni, the, the clear implication to a Hebrew speaker would be that those consonants should not be read as Adoni, right? And of course, the, the vowels are just an oral tradition, right? The vowels are something that are a tradition that the scribes pass on. And interestingly, Jesus says, who do the scribes say, uh, you know, this, the Messiah is the son of David. And so he kind of baits them into giving him that half of the, of the, you know, the claim and says, how could they call him Lord? Um, so I think that's just Jesus essentially saying without saying it out loud that, you know, that is a, 
it's it's Yahweh said to Adonai, and so it's got two Yahwehs in it. There's a similar passage in in Genesis where it says Yahweh sent fire from Yahweh out of heaven onto Sodom and Gomorrah, and a lot of later church fathers point to that as a passage where there's kind of two figures being referred to as Yahweh. But you can, in, in that one, you can just say, well, maybe it's just kind of an awkward way of saying, you know, Yahweh sent fire from himself. You know, he just sent fire. So you can you can say it's just an awkward, you know, wording or whatever. But <clears throat> it's hard to say if Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand. I mean, a person can't sit at his own right hand. So it seems like a a pretty powerful proof text if you admit that it's not really saying Adoni. <laughs> um, and oh. what I think happened is that that became a proof text in the early kind of Jewish Christian, you know, community. And when they tried to sort of pass that on to Greek speaking Gentiles that didn't really understand Hebrew, they knew this is okay. This is supposed to be our big kind of, you know, magic bullet proof text, but it doesn't really make sense if you say it in a, in a language other than Hebrew. Right? So anyway, that's just my little sort of pet, uh, pet yeah. theory on, on that. Well, uh, you might be happy to hear that you're not the only one. Um, oh, really? J James White, who's a hmm. Trinitarian apologist, he, um, he argued, uh, well, he argued a really he questioned the vowel points let's just say it okay. sounds like that's what you're doing you're questioning yeah. the vowel points now right. i would we say to that doctor that that's sort of a slippery slope because there are uh, as far as our count is concerned there are 195 mm -hmm. appearances of, of the word adoni with, with mm -hmm. the vowel points as you rightly say but then we'd have to say so should we question the other vowel mm -hmm. pointings in all other 194 times or is it just a matter of questioning the the hebrew scriptures at this point in psalm 1101 but the but the most pertinent proof that the vowel points are right mm -hmm. is like i told you at first the greek mm -hmm. again if you look at that phrase the way the the lxx right so yeah. Hundreds of years before Jesus, it was translated by the Jews themselves. So you're yeah. going to have to also throw shade, as they say, or question the 70 mm -hmm. uh, in 300 or whatever BC, and also the Masoretes in 800 AD or whatever. I yeah. mean, that's a long time. But again, the the fact is that Adoni is translated as Tokiriomu, yeah. which is never that phrase, doctor. And and again, please, our audience. These are just statistical facts yeah, I'm yeah. giving. I, it's not sort of my opinion, but that phrase is never used for for Yahweh, for deity. And one more thing, doctor, mm -hmm. if we say that there are two Yahwehs mm -hmm. in Psalm 110, 1, mm -hmm. then what do we do with the one Yahweh of the Shema? Mm -hmm. So that's one Yahweh too many. And that's the third problem I would have with that. I mean, of course, it's not that the idea isn't that they're, uh, I mean, Yahweh is not a count noun, right? It's it's just, it's a name. So um, the, the idea is just there are two figures that get referred to as Yahweh in the Old Testament. Um, you know, which one is sort of, so again, I mean, you know, I can, I can point to this photograph and say, that's my wife. Um, uh, so there are two things that I point to and say, that's my wife, but there's not, I'm not a, a bigamist, right? I don't have multiple wives. I just have the wife and then a representation of her wife, which by the way, is exactly, um, that's exactly St. Basil's response to the accusation that he was a tritheist. He says, we don't, uh, we don't talk about two emperors. We say there's the emperor and then there's an image. If you have a painting of the em emperor, so we call them both emperor, but that doesn't mean there's two emperors. Um, and like I was saying, you know, people tend to seamlessly switch back and forth between uh, names and pronouns for a thing and a representation of the thing. Um, so I don't think we necessarily get, you know, two, two Yahwehs. Uh, uh, just, as... just quickly, doctor, on your Genesis 19.24, where Yahweh reigned, uh, what is it? Fire from Yahweh. Yeah. Right. The Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. 
Yeah. So as Genesis 1924, again, many scholars through the centuries now have noted that that's a Hebrew way of speaking, because in other places you have, for example, in 1 Kings 8, verse 1, it says that Solomon mm -hmm. assembled the people before mm -hmm. Solomon. Yeah. So yeah. It, it doesn't oh, mean yeah, that. I, I acknowledge you can, you, can, Solomon, so. you, can, you can interpret it that way. Um, right. I, what I'm saying is be, because you can interpret those that way, right? They're not sort of, um, uh, it, it's, it's not as great of, a, of an argument as if, if you had Yahweh right. said to Yahweh. I'm sorry, said, I'm going to have to inter interject here, uh, Dr. Branson. I'm not trying to be rude, but uh, I mean, the audience is really going to get bogged down in this debates about the Hebrew. Nobody in the audience knows Hebrew. They don't know the grammar. I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> can we maybe bring it back to the bigger picture instead of getting kind of lost in this minutia oh, of... Uh, I'm not okay. saying these things don't matter. I'm just saying that the audience is really kind sure. of making a fuss here. So, I gotcha. look, yeah. I mean... Uh, you know, one thing I brought up earlier, Carlos, was that there's a lot of, of, of text in the Old Testament, which I'm sure you're going to dispute. Um, don't you don't you think that we have to give credence to the Bible as a whole? Right. I mean, don't you think sure. that there that we can't just pick certain verses out that justify our position? We kind of have to make sense of all the verses. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you think there's no verses that suggest any kind of distinctions in God in terms of persons? Right. Well, the question is about how basically it's like the question I asked the, the doctor earlier. God is how many persons exactly? And yeah. again, uh, I'm a custodian. I'm a slave to, to the scriptures that, again, time and again, reveal. And I think uh, Dr. Branson right. answered the father. And we, we agreed that there is only one person who is God and that is the father. Well, the God, in so, the, he's saying God in the specific sense of capital G, but the, right. the scriptures refer to other persons as well. Sure, sure. God's little G gods, right? There are many gods, many lords. No, I mean, there's plenty of texts um, that refer to the Holy Spirit, to the son having the exact same power as the father. Yeah, right. I mean, Jesus walked on water. Uh, Maybe, does, um, does that make him... You know, Yahweh, Jehovah. Well, some obviously say so. he does, but <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, he's worshipped and he receives and calls himself the I Am many times in the Gospel of John. Right. So, worship, as as we all know, is is a very um, malleable term in in no, the it's not not you when the worship. phrase God is used, not when my Lord and my God is used by Thomas. Right. So now you're throwing John twenty twenty eight, and the way we understand that is that Thomas is seeing God the Father in Jesus, and okay. that's from John 14. So in John 14, you know, the apostles are, look, just, just show us the Father and, and be done with it. And Jesus says, look, you've been with me so long. If you see me, you see the Father. So that's one of the ways we can understand John 20, 28, that Thomas, the same person from John 14, finally comes to faith, let's call it, that the father is in jesus and yeah but you, you don't know, believe the father is in jesus maybe maybe a better well, in a in a spiritual sense obviously <laughs> you know the fullness the fullness of deity dwelt in in the body of jesus but I you don't believe, believe that you don't believe the fullness of the godhead dwells bodily in christ i i believe no, you just that... reinterpret it to something else well uh paul puts it this way uh jay god was in christ not god right was that's the christ. trinity bro yeah, but we don't okay, think... well, I understand that as simply God was, you know, uh, working through his son and, and so on. Sorry, but he Dr. receives Christ. worship and he's given the titles and the names of Lord Yahweh, right? John the Baptist prepares the way for Yahweh. Maybe, maybe John the more, Baptist prepare uh, the way for him? Maybe a more productive thing to do would, would just be to maybe see what Carlos's view is about the, the Old Testament theophanies. Because I, I think that... Okay. I mean, sure. a lot of stuff that you're pointing out, too, is you want to say, look, you know, there's this figure that gets worship and that, you know, is called Yahweh and people say, oh, I can't believe I didn't die. I saw this. So, I mean, I, I've already said kind of what I think. I think. I think the New Testament's clear that no one has ever seen capital G God, the father. And so this has to be some different figure. So and I this is actually something I don't know much about what 
biblical Unitarians say about this. So what what is kind of a, well, I don't know if there's a single biblical Unitarian view or if maybe you just have your own view, but, but how do you make sense out of the Old Testament passages where God does appear to people? Well, again, uh, I can only go by the scriptures. So in the New Testament, for example, I, th- I believe it's in Acts 7 or 8, when Stephen gives this long discourse to his fellow Israelites yeah. and then, you know, and then condemns them all. <laughs> you, <laughs> you idiot. Uh, he says things like the figure that appeared to Moses, right, in the bush was an angel. Now, yeah. if we go Again, so to, to me, the... we already addressed this, though, that, that this is you're just assuming that the term means a creature. Well, let him let him. Well, again, uh, I need to see a lexicon or just a dictionary where Malak or Angelos does not. Uh, OK, mean... I'll give you one right now. When, in Genesis 16, when Hagar sees the angel of the Lord, she says, I have seen my Lord and my God. Right, because God is working through the angel. The angel is called God. It doesn't say the angel is working through God. Yes, yes, they identified the message. So you're just reinterpreting the position. Well, well I, I was times I was also as, asking for a lexicon, Jay. That's a, a lexical definition yeah. of Malaco Angelos. I mean, I gave you an example of Angelos receiving worship, being okay. called God. Does right. Do angels redeem people? I mean, in Genesis 49, the angel redeems. Yes, uh, ex, Exodus 23. No, no creatures uh, don't redeem. Exodus 23 says that God puts his name in the angel, which means his authority, and people are to obey him. And if they don't obey, he will not forgive people their sin. That's the messenger of the Lord. So so you're an idolater. You believe creatures can save and redeem. Well, if God gives you the power to forgive sins, like Jesus was given the power to forgive sins. Yeah, because he's the son of God. We don't believe that creatures have that power. Do you believe that a creature can stop the sun? By divine power, yes. Well, that's what I'm saying. By divine power, God divinely gives his power to people that he chooses. Sam, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Carlos did it again with his uh, misrepresentation of two querido mu. So I'm going to have him open up to Psalm 16, verse 2, and then you can read the Greek. Uh, Carlos, open your Bible to Psalm 16, verse 2. We're gonna have fun. Okay, so, so this is now turning to a. It's it's yeah. A it's three, a a three on one. That's okay. Jay Jay's the host. He asked me to come. You guys are uncomfortable. It's all right. We'll we'll get over it by tomorrow when we wake up in the morning. Because this is about the glory of Jesus. It's not about the praise of men. Go to Psalm sixteen, verse two. Tell me, right. is that referring to Yahweh as Adonai? Right. Okay. Again, uh, I, I'd have to look at it. Yes, I don't have it with okay, me. Well, open up. I'm sure you have Bible software because I'm going to show you, because I'm going to ask you the Greek version of Psalm 16, verse 2. Everyone heard you say it. To periomu is never used for God, never used for deity. Now, I'm going to be gracious and say it's because you don't know the Bible. That's an ignorant statement because it is. Because in the Greek version, Psalm 15, verse 2, guess what the Greek says? The Greek says, to periu, and then it says, Kyrios Mu. So can you confirm it? Because I don't want you to take my word for it. Confirm that there Adonai, who's Jehovah, is said to be to Kiryu, and then it says Kyrios Mu. And then we're going to look at Psalm 34, 23, because we need to put this argument to bed. Enough of this argument. It's not true. Can you not okay. confirm it? Uh, Jay, I only have a couple of minutes left on my time here. So if anyone else has questions... I'm happy to take them, Q&A. And, and soon well, I'll have to, and soon I'll have to go. Thanks, Jay. That's what it is. Why aren't you answering my question? I'm a questioner. Answer my question, and then go to Psalm well, 35, 23. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. All right. Well, we have a question from Yehu. He sends twenty bucks, and he says this is an important topic that many Muslims deal with. Yes, we're seeing a lot of the same sort of apologetic. Uh, uh, questions that, that uh, Islamic apologists answer, but uh, or use, but uh, I don't think I don't think we're going to get a coherent answer in terms of any of that stuff tonight. By the way, Jay. Yep. For the benefit of the Christians here, because he's not going to answer, let me put this argument to rest. It's not true. It is a lie 
that tu kiriumu is not used for the true God. Let me give everyone, and the beauty about you guys is, because you're Orthodox, you read the scriptures in Greek. Psalm 15, verse 2, <clears throat> Psalm 34, 22 to 24. There you're going to find Jehovah, Yahweh, called Adonai. And here in Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2, let me read it. Keep, keep me, kiri, for I have hoped in thee. I said to the Lord, to Kiryu, thou art my Lord, uh, Kurias Mu, Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 35, which again, in, in the Greek, is Psalm 34, 22 to 24. Psalm 34, 22 to 24. It's just the benefit for my brothers and sisters. Carlos has one answer. That's okay. I'm doing it for them, for their education. Psalm 34, 22 to 24. Thou hast seen, seen it, O Lord, Kiri. And if you go back to the Hebrew, it's Yahweh, Jehovah, Yod, He, Vav, He. Keep not silence, O Lord, Kiri. Withdraw not thyself from me. Awake, O Lord, Kiri, and attend to my judgment, even to my cause, my God and my Lord, O Theosmu, Ke, Kiriasmu, Kiriasmu, Kiriasmu. Oh, wow, but I thought too, Kiriumu is never used for God. Kirias is simply the nominative, whereas Kiriu is the dative. That's all it is. It's the it's same Yahweh's word. Bottom, I don't Say it again. I didn't hear you. So, so just bottom line being sometimes Yahweh is called Adoni. My well, Lord. no, in the Hebrew here, it's Adonai. His argument, Kiriu doctor, was Tu Kiriumu is never used for deity. That's not true. So I'm going to be gracious and say he doesn't know the Bible. But if someone like Anthony Buzzard, who claims to know scripture, then he's lying. It is a lie. I'm sorry. It's Fair not enough. true. Tu uh, Kiriumu nope. in its various You just forms. got on here to call people liars. We're not. I didn't call you a liar. That, that's, why, be, you know, that's, why, that's why I refuse to debate you. And, oh, all, you and all the people you're <laughs> sending to challenge me to debate you. You refuse to debate me and, because. You and I sort of had a suspicion okay. that this would happen, by the way. And no. thanks very much, Jay. Yeah. This guy, this guy is is quite That's a right. character. Not this guy, this guy who's zealous for the true God and exposed. Right. Well, we'll we'll find, we'll find out, brother. We'll find out one day. We'll find out. Nineteen twenty-four. We'll find out one day. Why That's are you the beauty of all this? God. Let's deal with Genesis nineteen twenty-four, which you again misrepresented by appealing to supposedly some grammatical expression that does not does not. <clears throat> have anything to do with Genesis 19, 4, 24. The example you gave, Solomon built with Solomon, is totally alien to this context because, Carlos, I want you to explain to me, according to the context in Genesis 18, verses 1 to 33, and Genesis 19, was Yahweh on earth as a man? I hope you don't say no. I hope you don't, because if you read Genesis 19, 24 and 27, it says Abraham went to the place where Yahweh stood before him. So this is not at all analogous to the idiom when Solomon built from Solomon, because here you have Yahweh on earth as a man who spoke to Abraham and then appeared to Lot to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, bringing fire from Yahweh out of the heaven. This is nothing similar to the example you gave, because you have Yahweh on earth as a man and Yahweh in heaven. Could you now correct yourself? Simon? All right. Well, I don't know if there's, is there any, anything, yeah. anything yep. else? <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, you or... that. Anyway, just, uh, just yeah. was for the benefit. I know the doctor is very All right. good and God yep. bless the doctor. One day I'll be like you and your gracious assembly. <laughs> when I get there, I'll Lord, like you with your, someone, yeah. good luck. This information, I can't handle it. something in my, no, you can't do this to my Lord and my God in the scripture. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not here to hold hands with this guy. We're here about <laughs> the truth of God and has to do with eternal salvation. And I'm going to be very upfront and politically incorrect. This guy, if he keeps going, then he's not going to see God in mercy. He's going to see God's wrath because he's perverting the scripture and robbing Jesus of his glory as the God man. Live with it. Jesus is your God and Savior. Live with it. Either repent and accept him or stop blaspheming him because we're going to put an end to it by the grace of Jehovah Jesus. Yeah, well, God, it's, what, de it's definitely God the case you that uh, that uh, Arianism Arianism is enough of a heresy that it deprives us of the grace of God, right? I mean, Jesus essentially Incredible. makes himself the bridge to God, and so who what we believe about Jesus is 
tantamount, hey, you know, when it comes hey, to our salvation. Yes, Carlos, when are you going to debate me, Carlos? Why Sam, don't you bring your father-in-law, both of you, in one night? Sam, uh, Jesus commands you to love your enemies. You don't sound very loving right now. It's the same Jesus in Matthew 23. Why, that why are you treating me worse than your enemies? Okay, well, like Jesus, let me give you Jesus. In it's a simple question like you're asking <laughs> me. So You mean the same Jesus? All Matthew right, buddy. So not, let me answer. Uh, thank answer. you, uh, Dr. Branson. You were very kind. Thank you for your humility. Well, I, and thanks, Jay, for the platform here. You for thank you. Bit, Carlos, appreciate it. Yep, that's what they do when they can. Oh. They appeal to emotion and ad hominem. You know that, Jay. Jay, I love your zeal, brother. You're a warrior for Christ, man. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. And uh, thank you for uh, the entertaining evening. Uh, I didn't want it to be just entertainment. I think it was. I think it was good. I think this is great. Thank you all for right. participating. Be sure and follow. I'll have Sam's link below as well. You can check out Dr. Branson's uh, material at his uh, links below. And then we'll be back very soon for another uh, entertaining uh, and enlightening event. God bless you guys. Thank you. I listen, Jake. See you later. Uh-uh.